Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Nice to hear your voices. Good evening. Good evening. I know. I know we're making a difference with you guys because. It took me about six weeks to finally get people to take their phones off mute at the beginning. So you guys are coming in saying good afternoon. So I love it. How are you? Doing very well. I'm excited about this topic tonight because uh, I'll just go ahead and, 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 and let you guys know anything Dr. Valdez is around with um, our presentations is always an awesome session. Um, it's always good. So <laughs> you guys are in for a treat. And she brought, she brought a crew with her tonight. That's awesome. All right. Well, what we'll go ahead and do, uh, more people will be coming in. But what we'll do is um, we've started this maybe about five or six weeks ago. Um, and I think we're just, this will kind of be our new tradition. Uh, so what we'd like to do is just have a few people share uh, something good that has happened to them. It doesn't have to be something about school, but just something good to get some positive energy in the atmosphere. Um, I guess I can go. Um, I went to Arkansas uh, last week and it was pretty exciting because I got to see some people that I haven't seen for a couple years. So... Yeah, I'm excited. I was excited about that. Awesome. That's that's I think that's two weeks in a row where people got a chance to get some family time and and just see family or friends. So that's important. Uh, that that's a good setup for our session for next week as we talk about um our work life balance or integration or however we're gonna figure it out. But that's our discussion for next week as well. Uh, anyone wants to join? I'm on vacation. Something positive. I'm going on vacation in two weeks. No, Evan, you're just going all over the world. You're going, uh, going to the south. You're going on yeah, vacation. in two weeks. Awesome. That's, that's my vacation in the south North Carolina. Oh, okay. You're going to, that's when you're making that trip to the Carolinas. Yep, huh? in two weeks. Awesome. Congrats again. Thank you. All right. Number three. One more. Um, I'm going to, my great grandmother is going to turn a hundred in August sixth. So I'll be taking a trip to California in about three weeks or a couple of weeks from now. Well that's pretty cool. And I'm really excited for it because it's it's been like I think twelve years that I haven't seen my mom's family. So I'm really excited for it. Oh, I'm happy for you. You get family, grandma's birthday, 100 years old, and you get California. So that's a lot of good in, in one trip. All right, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping real quick, guys. So tonight, um, Dr. Valdez and the team will actually have a combination of a few slides along with the panel discussion. Uh, we want your questions. We want your questions. We want your questions. We want your energy. We want your passion. Uh, you guys have done a great job this summer. Now I know we're getting into July. We're coming down to the home stretch here. So let's just finish strong. Um, we, um, I, I, I set it up earlier for those that were not on, but I said Dr. Valdez, every session she's done with this has been amazing. Uh, but what I will say is when I first met Dr. Valdez, the first session I attended, um, was actually me just kind of working. I, I went to attend, but then I had to work because we had so many students at our conference that wanted to get in and learn about graduate school. Um, and Dr. Valdez, like, like the room wasn't big enough. So we had to go get more people. So not only do we get Dr. Valdez tonight, but we have three other uh, panelists that will be with us tonight and they'll all introduce themselves. Uh, so you guys are in for a treat. Um, I want to make sure you guys maximize the hour. Uh, so make sure you got the Q&A feature. Uh, we'd love to get your questions in there. Uh, you got the raise your hand feature. That's part of it as well. Um, and then uh, Dr. Valdez actually has sections on the PowerPoint where 
you can, you know, if you didn't have a question and all of a sudden she'll have a slide that pops up that reminds us that this is a good interaction moment. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Valdez, uh, the show's yours tonight. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction, Brian. Um, yeah, when we first met, that was a crazy session. We thought it would be kind of a small we were thinking an intimate uh, session on grad school admissions uh, process, and I had lots of activities, and and we had the room set up to be able to do all of that, and we ended up with like triple <laughs> triple the attendance. So uh, it was a pretty pretty fun session. It was great, and so I love that we get to do this virtually, and I hope that you know soon we'll be all back together for the conference. Um, well, uh, anyway, so. Uh, I, I'm Dr. Valdez. I am an assistant professor of chemistry at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Um, I'm originally from Oklahoma, and so this is, I've recently returned back home. I, when I was an undergrad, I went to Southwestern Oklahoma State University, and uh, while I was there, I was an OKL SAMP scholar. Um, so this is my group, and so I'm super, super excited to be here with you all and getting to talk about applying to grad school. and, um, and and that I've got these amazing panelists um, with me. And so we're going to move right into the introductions. Um, and so I have a slide um, here to, to remind our panelists. I'm going to have them go ahead and introduce themselves. Um, and I'll let them unmic and just give us a quick overview um, of, of where, where you were for undergrad, where you're at now, and, and any other fun facts that you want to share. Hi everyone, I'm Lizette Tamayo. I am currently a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago. I went to undergrad at Augustana College. I was part of the Inspire LSAMP um, Alliance. And um, right now I'm studying genetic epidemiology. So if there's anything, anybody that's interested in things like that, I'm more than happy to chat with you guys. Super excited to be here. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Aaron West. I am originally from um, a south suburb of Chicago. I completed my associates of biology, um, associates of science and biology at Prairie State Community College. I transferred to Governor State University um, where I recently completed my bachelor's of science in biology in May of 2020. Um, after one semester of graduate work at Governor State University, um, I'm happy to say that I am now transitioning to uh, the University of Kentucky, uh, where I'll be pursuing my PhD in biology. Um, and the first semester I'll be doing a rotation. So that is me. I also enjoy the outdoors. Um, that was a little fun fact. So. Thank you. Last but not least, are you able to unmute? Sure. Hi, okay. everyone. I'm Laila Tubambara. I'm from the East Coast, from Newark, New Jersey. Um, I went to undergrad at ISS County College. Uh, that's where I got my first college degree, um, which was an associate of science in biology. And from there, I transferred to Rutgers University, Newark, where I got my bachelor of science in biology as well. And from Rutgers, Newark, then I went to Montclair State University, and that is where I got my Master of Science in Biology as well. And finally, I will be studying my PhD in Microbial Biology at Rutgers University in New Brunswick this upcoming fall. And during my undergrad years, I was a part of the ELSEM program, the Garden State, and actually I also was the coordinator for SS County College ELSEM. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you all. Um, so as you all can see, I have this rock star panel um, with me today. And so I'm going to do um, a little bit of talking. Um, I have some slides just to kind of um, contextualize what we're going to talk about. But for the most part, I want to hear from the panelists. And I also want to hear from you all attending about what questions you have for them. So um, as we just had those kind of pink background slides or when we're going to pause to be asking questions of the panelists, 
I have some already pre-populated, but if there are things on topic that you have questions about while we're on that, feel free um, to do the raise your hand or put it in the Q&A and we can um, pause to um, answer those questions. And then we'll also have time at the end, hopefully for Q&A. So um, this is the agenda. I'm gonna start by talking about just high level, what is grad school, a little bit about preparing for grad school, um, and then finally succeeding when you are in graduate school. So we'll go ahead and get started with the what is grad school. And so when you think of grad school, you might think of a number of different things such as medical school, law school, dental school, a master's degree, veterinary school, a doctorate, business school, the PhD, education school, MBA. Um, but there's actually two different categories. So there's graduate school and there's professional school. And so um, this quick animation moves all of these into the categories. And so um, when we're talking about graduate school, what we're really talking about is the master's degree, sometimes the doctoral degree, um, and then the PhD, which is the philosophy doctorate. Um, education kind of sits in the center. Sometimes it falls in the professional side of things um, with like leadership development programs, and sometimes there can be an actual like education PhD. Um, and then on the professional side of things are um, degrees such as, you know, being a, a vet, a a medical doctor, a dentist, all of those things, business, finance, et cetera. So um, what we're focused on is really graduate school for um, this uh, conversation. And so this is what we'll be talking about today. Um, but uh, that doesn't exactly tell you what grad school is. So um, it's either master's or PhD is typically how we think about it. It's a really deep dive into a topic. So um, you get to do research on something that's really interesting to you and you start narrowing. In undergrad, you have like a broad, you know, sweep of, of a topic. Maybe it's biology or chemistry or um, engineering, right? And you learn a lot about that field. When you're in graduate school, you're learning a lot about a little. So you're going really deep into a very narrow amount of um, information. Um, it is an opportunity to increase your income. So having those advanced degrees, graduate degrees, does increase your earning potential uh, for your career. Um, it can also open doors. So there are, um, you know, glass ceilings in the type of um, work that you can do if you have only a bachelor's degree. Um, and so there can be limitations that by having that master's degree or that PhD, you can actually continue to advance your career. Um, it does give you distinction. Um, and so, you know, that can be important, especially um, as a scholar of color, um, you know, having that distinction, having those kind of um, extra things um, in your toolkit can be really important. Again, going back to opening doors and earning potentials. Um, and then, of course, a grad school is all about the research. And so um, that's kind of a high level view of what grad school is. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about the differences a little bit between a master's degree degree and um, the PhD. So master's degrees are finite in time. They're going to be one to two year programs. And you know that going into the program, um, which can give you some comfort <laughs> in knowing exactly what you're getting into. Um, there are typically two different types of master's degrees. Uh, there's the taught master's degrees, and then there's the research um, master's degrees. So by taught, what I mean is that um, for majority of the time that you're in that degree, what you're doing is taking courses. Whereas a research master's degree might spend um, you know, some, a larger portion of that time conducting research, either doing a thesis or a capstone project or something along those lines. Um, and so exactly may have a thesis. Um, and typically a master's degree is going to cost you money. You are going to have to pay to um, pursue that degree. Um, there are research assistantships and teaching assistantships that can help with that. But typically for the master's degree, you will have to pay for that degree. Um, the kind of why you might, you know, pursue a master's degree. Um, if you're unsure about a PhD um, or you want to improve your application, it can be a really great opportunity to, um, you know, if you were 
worried about your GPA from undergrad, it can be a chance for you to get a better GPA, but at the graduate level, showing that you're able to um, take on that level of rigor and, and coursework. Um, it can also be a chance to, you know, improve your research skills if you feel like, you know, you haven't had enough research skills as an undergrad, but you all are LSAM scholars, so I'm not worried about that for any of you. So, um, but that's, that's um, some reasons why you might consider the master's over the PhD. Uh, PhD, uh, and as all of uh, the panelists know, is a variable end point. Um, so anywhere from five to eight years is typically how long a PhD will last. Um, in the life sciences, the average is usually a six years. Um, and some of the um, uh, humanities and social sciences, they can continue on for eight or longer years. Um, but I think in the STEM fields are typically five to six years is pretty common. Um, but there is not any certainty in that. And it's really about when your project is done, um, which can be challenging when you're in the middle of it. And um, I'm sure that we'll talk about that at some point in the panel today. Um, so the first and second years are usually you're taking some courses. Um, the first year will probably be pretty heavy in courses. The second year, depending on the curriculum and expectations of the program, um, you might have a half a year in the second year that's courses. You might spread it out a little bit, but um, that's when you're taking those courses. And then you move into really doing research full time for the remainder of the program. So um, at some point in year two, you are typically going to, um, you know, you're going to be working in your thesis in your dissertation lab, um, you're going to be um, beginning that dissertation project. Um, and so you're going to be doing research full time for years three, four, five, until you finish. Um, the dissertation is kind of a full body of work. It's a project from start to end. Um, and so you are trying to tell some type of story um, from the beginning to the end as part of your dissertation. And so when that project is done, um, that's when you are done um, with the PhD. And so um, so getting that getting that project done really is what determines how long that 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 the degree actually takes. Um, and the sciences uh, PhD is typically going to pay you. So they typically will provide um, some type of tuition um, a waiver for you uh, while you're in the PhD, and then they also will typically pay you a stipend. Um, sometimes that stipend is attached to either an RA ship, a research assistantship, and sometimes it's attached to a teaching assistantship, or depending on what year you are, um, it may vary in the program over time. Um, and so uh, some programs also will pay for fees, which are things that maybe include things like gym membership or, um, uh, you know, a student government fee or activity fee or um, might also include like your health uh, insurance. Um, so some of the institutional pay for that. Some of the times you actually have to pay for that using your stipend that you're earning in graduate school. So um, from there, I'm going to actually uh, pause to ask the, the panelists a little bit about what the structure is of their graduate program. So um, what does that kind of look like as far as like, when are you taking courses? When are you doing research? Um, and anything else you want to kind of share on kind of the curriculum and broader structure of that of your program. So whoever wants to go first can. I can start. Um, so for my program, it was very similar to what Dr. Valda said. I had two years very much of like a lot of coursework. And um, during the first year, um, my program in, um, has like research rotations. So you don't have to come in in which knowing who you want to work with already. So you can come in and sort of know the the essence of what you want to do and choose three people that you were going to work with that year. Um, and that's sort of like works really well because that you don't have to stick with one and then you're stuck with somebody for five or more years um, and then end up no, realizing you don't like the research or things like that. Um, so I think that research rotations is something that potentially is maybe newer. I'm not entirely sure, but um, it is something that I think is really nice and probably something that um, to ask around about when you're when you're applying for graduate schools. I, I'll let um, Aaron and um, our other panelists talk more about theirs as well. Yeah, I can bounce off of what Lizette said about um, 
the rotation process. Um, it's uh, since I'm pretty early in the graduate um, school uh, tract, um, I'll speak a little bit to funding where um, I know some departments look very favorably on students who apply for uh, PhD admissions versus um, masters. Um, at least that was the case for me when I was applying to the University of Kentucky. Um, it was one um, insured funding if I was a PhD student. Um, and then with a master's degree, I usually had to apply for uh, that funding through a a research assistantship or a teaching assistantship. Um, but per se at my smaller university at Governor State, um, I didn't have that option to do a, um, a rotation as I have the option to, to do at the University of Kentucky. Um, at Governor State, which is a small university, I, it was very, it, it's a lot more intimate. Um, so I got to firsthand speak with the professors and see what project I kind of wanted to do and then go from there. Well, my program at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, if you are a first year student, you will have to take some core courses, could be two or three per semester, and then you will have to register for lab rotations as well. So each lab rotation is about eight weeks. Um, and you will have to complete at least three of them with name two semesters. And if for any reason you still don't find any match um, between your rotation and the professor, they can arrange for the fourth and the fifth lab rotation along with your courses. So you will mainly come with a fellowship. Like for example, I came in with the self excellence fellowship. So I don't have to worry about teaching assistantship or graduate assistantship for my first year. So that only comes on your second year of your classes. And then you will have to eventually register for a fellowship course. It's a zero credit course, but they want you to attend. And they also have um, a free grant fund program in case you want to apply for more fellowship, which is usually called external fellowship and then grants too. But yes, may, basically your first year, you're gonna register for classes, you're gonna have lab rotation, but you don't have to worry about teaching or doing any assistantship at all. Thank you all for sharing about your structure, your programs, and thank you for bringing up the lab rotation. So um, it depends on your field, whether or not you'll have lab rotation. So typically in the engineering um, sciences, they don't have the lab rotations. You would come in knowing probably who you are going to work with. Um, but of course, it's going to be program specific. And so you want to make sure that you look into that within the program um, to know that. But in the life sciences, um, the rotations are pretty common. Um, you know, the, the, fewest I've seen is two, um, the most required is four. Um, and so it's going to depend on the program. I would say my, my PhD program, I think, um, much like, um, one of our panelists said was, you know, there were core courses that were required. We had four core courses that were required as part of the program um, or expected. I think later they became required. They're now required. Um, they were expected. And so, um, and we had a paper reading course that was part of our core curriculum that was required. Um, and then we had electives that we could take. And then um, we did, we had a minimum, I think, of two rotations in six weeks um, for, my, for my PhD program. And my program was um, the Harvard Biomedical Sciences program. So um, yeah, so each program is a little bit different and how that flavor shakes out. And so knowing about what that looks like and whether it looks like something you're interested in is important as you try to identify um, grad programs, which is a nice segue to our next section of the talk, which is about preparing for graduate school, which really has to do with um, trying to identify those schools um, and figuring out what's going to be a good fit for you. So I always recommend that um, before you start the application process that you identify eight to 10 programs or schools of interest. Um, sometimes there may be more than one program at a school that you're interested in applying to. So um, it may not actually be, you know, eight to 10 schools because you're gonna apply to two programs at one of the schools because they happen to have like the best faculty that really fit what you're interested in. Um, at each of those programs, I recommend that you find a minimum of three faculty that you 
are interested in working with. And so um, the way that you do that is, you know, start searching websites and trying to identify faculty who um, are interesting to you. Um, your current PI is a great person to start with. You could ask them who they recommend um, based on your research interest, um, what schools you might want to look into and things like that, as well as your LSAMP director might be able to help with that. Um, and you also could start thinking about like some of the papers that you really like the science that folks are doing well look up the last author look up where that pi is at what department are they in what program are they in um, and those might be programs that would be of interest to you so um i also say to get organized and i have an example on that that we'll come back to in just a little bit and then of course you want to uh, line up those recommenders and you want to start early on those recommendations so um pretty soon in the next month or so you'd want to be you know beginning to reach out to your recommenders about um, asking them to write letters to give them enough time so that everything can kind of get order in order um, for you to apply if you're applying this fall so um, thinking about that uh, would you all be willing to share um, how many graduate programs you applied to and um, and and what those were if you can remember <laughs> yeah um I think I was potentially an exception for this. I only applied to two. Um, and I don't recommend that. I really recommend what Dr. Valdez said. Um, and I applied to UCSF and U Chicago. And I was very fortunate that I got into both, but I didn't like know other researchers that I wanted to work with besides the ones that I applied to. Um, and so it was, um, I just sort of applied to the ones I wanted to get into but you really should look into like deeper or farther and wider. Um, and I think that's really, really good advice. Um, I, at first I had a list of about, I had about two lists of about more than 15 on each list of the graduate programs that I wanted to apply to. Um, but like Lizette, I only applied to three. Um, one was the University of Kentucky and the Department of Biology program. Um, I was following funding. Um, they had funding attached to their program. So that's why, um, that's one of the reasons uh, why I chose that as one of my top choices, um, as well as the labs that they offered. I really did enjoy those too. Um, I also applied to Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia to their marine science program. And I believe I also applied to Idaho State University um, because there was a professor that was looking into some research that had closely correlated to some of my undergraduate research. Um, but yeah, if, if I could have, I would have applied to a lot more, but only three. I applied to seven PhD schools, actually. Um, Two of them were outside of my major, and then five of them were within my major. And I started applying with the two that were outside of my major because um, those two were my backup plan, just in case. Um, and then I waited until I went for the interview and when they said no, and then I just moved on and then went to my five PhD schools within my majors. And why did I do that? So I did that because, um, first of all, I wasn't sure if I was going to get into my backup plan because I wasn't sure how the interview were going to go. But I was hoping that I would learn something from the interview and then apply it to, <laughs> to, my, main, <laughs> to my main major course for my PhD. And it did work out for me. So I suggest you apply to at least five schools because medical school, I mean, um, PhD schools are very competitive. Um, they are very competitive. And most schools, they only take like within five to nine students um, every fall. So definitely apply to more than five schools. Thank you so much. That's great advice. Yeah, I think uh, I love the backup of the backup uh, plans and, and that you're clearly a planner and it's worked out well for you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, graduate schools are getting more and more competitive all the time. Um, and so you want to be applying to a, a wide, um, you know, 
a wide net of opportunities to make sure that you're going to get into those programs, but you also want to make sure that you're picking schools that you're really committed to because you don't want to waste your time putting together applications for somewhere you're not willing to go. You also don't want to waste your recommender's time putting those letters together and then the faculty's time who are at those schools, you know, reviewing those applications. So make sure that they're places that, you know, even if it's a backup backup, that you would go there if that's the only option that you had. So I always Always talk to my students about that that make sure that you know if this is the only one you get into you'd still go so um, there's a little bit uh, here just talking about some of what you can do to kind of identify those schools um, and and what you might be considering as the factors as you start to think about what schools you want to go to um, and so of course you may want to start with the faculty um, so who are those folks that you might be working with at your and at the institution that you hope to go to for grad school um, and I already mentioned you know talk to your mentor your PI talk to you know your LSAMP director talk with LSAM alumni, um, you know, talk to folks about who might be good as a faculty, you know, advisor for your master's thesis or dissertation. Um, so think about that. Um, topic, of course, is important because what you're going to research is, is going to be important. Um, you want to make sure it's something that you can be interested in and interested in for, say, five to seven years. Um, location, um, I uh, have disagreements with uh, colleagues on this all the time, but I think location matters. Um, folks say things like, you're just going to be inside the lab. What does it matter? But I'm like, you know, you're a whole person and you might want to do things outside the lab. Um, if you're somebody who likes hiking and camping and being outdoors, like you want to pick somewhere that that's going to be, you know, some something you can do right. And on your weekends or in your time off. Right. Um, if you're somebody who loves to be in an urban area and like wants to, or, uh, you know, really wants to be in a city, right. Like choose schools that are in those types of areas. If um, you really want or need to be close to your family or your support system, right? Pick schools that are going to be within, you know, a relatively easy commute to, to those folks, right? So I think that location matters. Funding is absolutely important. You want to make sure that you're getting a good funding package and that you're going to be able to um, be able to support yourself while you're in graduate school for things like rent and, um, you know, other bills and all of the other things that you're going to want to do. Um, you also want to think about what support net, um, support services there might be. Um, think about that curriculum. Does that coursework seem like something you're interested in? I applied to programs that had as few as four required courses, and my PhD program ended up having eight, and I felt like eight was a lot. Um, and so, you know, you have to kind of think about like how many courses do you really want to take as you look at that curriculum and what's available. Um, other unique aspects of the program, like maybe they have like a cool internship that you can do or some type of other, like, I don't know, uh, spinoff type thing. Maybe they have a um, entrepreneurial track um, or a consulting track or something that might be of interest to you. What are those things that make that program unique that, that make you want to go to it? And then of course, thinking about time to completion, that's pretty standardized. Um, it's pretty standardized, um, uh, you know, uh, in STEM, it's going to be about five to seven years. That's what you can expect. Um, but, um, you know, if you, you might consider looking at that across the programs, and if there are ones that are a little bit longer, you want to find out why and also learn more about like, what do those students go on to do? Maybe they're taking a little bit longer to do their degree, but they're landing really fabulous positions after that, right? Um, so lots of things to think about as you research schools and try to figure out what's going to be the right fit for you. And so um, in thinking about that, I'd love to hear from our panelists about what factors were the most of those factors that I just showed, um, what were the most important for you as you considered um, your graduate program and ultimately decided on the ones that you went to? And if you need me to go back a slide, I can. I'll start, okay. For me, it was location-wise, like Dr. Valde said. Um, I am originally from Burkina Faso, West Africa. So um, my grandfather is not doing well physically. And I was like, well, if I'm in New Jersey, it's easier to get there than if I'm all the way on the West Coast in California. So yeah, location also matters. 
Um, the second one was the GRE. So some graduate school, they will not ask you for a GRE or they would waive it for X, Y, or Z reason. For example, when I went for my Master of Science in Biology at Montclair State University, I did not have a GRE score, but I had a MCAT score, which is for medical school. So they use that as a substitute for me to get my MS. Um, so for my graduate school, they didn't need any GRE. And then when I look at other programs, they did well because of COVID, because I did apply in, in the middle of COVID. So those, those were the two main factors that I chose my graduate program. For me, it was both location and funding. Um, my community college is not too far from my four-year university. Um, and my four-year university was not big. So I knew that if I did pursue graduate school, I wanted to go to a one to an R1 university. I wanted to go to a pretty large university and also an urban university. Um, and I don't know if I said diverse university as well. Um, but also a diverse university. So location and funding were two of the biggest for me. Um, and I know it's different for everybody, but you know, in my instance, uh, when I was applying to Idaho State University, I was very um, weary because one, it's, it's, it's way on the, on the West Coast. You know, I'm, I'm an adventurous soul, but it's away from a lot of people that I know. Um, and I, would, I was very worried about uh, the diverse aspect, you know, when I see people who look like me on campus, um, and what I blend in, um, and things of that nature. For me, uh, it was also funding was also one of the top priorities when I was comparing the two programs. Um, and I also really looked at culture. So that was really important to me. Um, some programs can be really competitive. And I did not like, and not in terms of like, are they competitive as in a good program, but like with as in competitive within each other, they like some graduate students are always competing and maybe some people like that and they, they feel like it makes them do better. For me personally, that's not the type of environment where I thrive in. I think it like just, it doesn't make me feel like doing my best at all times. So that was something that I really got a sense for when I visited and I talked to the graduate students um, when I was being interviewed and I interviewed them as well. That like, that's something to always remember too, like on our interview days, like that we are also interviewing them, right? So that's really important. Um, and I really talked a lot to the students because I needed that perspective because if I was going to go to California and I, I've been in Illinois all um, like almost all my life. So like my support system is here that I really needed to know that like I was going to feel the support also from the surrounding students. Um, so while I was at U Chicago though, like I just felt that there was more support in terms of um, just the community within the graduate students. And that was something that really like finished it. Like the funding was there and then the support and that was really important to me. These are all great factors and really what which of these factors matter um you know is is going to be very personal right so for every everyone that's going to be very personal and something you have to explore and think about like what makes sense for you in this moment in time as you're you know applying to grad school and so thank you all for sharing those um reasons all right so i just want to quickly talk about again on the researching the grad schools um so in addition, um, you want to make sure that you're doing lots of networking as you're, you know, thinking about these grad schools, um, Lizeth was talking about um, during the interviews, making those connections, talking with folks about their experience at those schools um, to kind of get a better sense. Um, you also want to talk with, you know, again, faculty mentor, your program director, uh, career services at your institution might be able to also help you with this. Um, any alumni maybe that are LSAMP alums or alums of your institution. Institution. And then, of course, there's the larger LSAM community. And so um, you can always reach out to folks. And I know that um, you all are involved with um, NALA. So maybe one of you could do a quick, a quick plug. You want to do a commercial? Yeah, I can do a quick commercial. Um, so thank you for giving us this time, Dr. Valdez. But um, <laughs> if you guys don't know, there is the National Association of LSAM Alumni, or NALA. And so once you guys graduate from your perspective, uh, respective um, LSAMP alliances, 
you guys get to join us. And we're essentially this huge network of, ally of El Samp alumni from all across the country and Puerto Rico. And we're just doing really great stuff and keeping each other connected, doing different panels like this and making sure that like we know the power that we hold as alumni. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, so you have this network that you can plug into. So, you know, if you were to reach out, like if I had a random student reach out to me on LinkedIn said, hey, I saw that you're an LSAMP scholar. Um, can you tell me about your experience at Harvard as a grad student? I would be happy to meet with them for anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and be like, of course, I'm going to tell you, like, tell me all your questions. Um, and so, you know, I know that this is a network that's really strong and that you should feel comfortable reaching out to folks and and, and asking them about their experiences at different schools and, and um, that kind of stuff. So we will uh, move along. Um, I promised that I would tell you more about what I meant by getting organized. And so um, this is a screenshot of a um, an Excel uh, sheet that I've created uh, that you all will get in the resources after this program. Uh, and so uh, it just is a way that you can organize it. You can take things out. You can add things in um, whatever you want to help you get organized. But the idea is so that you can know what those application deadlines are for the programs that you do end up um, being interested in um, what the school is, um, what department or program you might apply to, the faculty that you're interested in, because once you start looking at 8, 10, 20 schools, the faculty start to blend together. So you might go further than this and say, okay, here's these faculty, but I'd also like to add like a little snippet on what their research is or, you know, maybe you include a hyperlink or something. Um, and then here is like unique aspects of the program. So things that make it special, um, a little bit about the statement of purpose and other essays. So um, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, number of letters required. Um, you might include who your letter writers are. Um, this is something that you could actually share with your recommender and you can choose whether or not you want to hide this, um, who the other letter writers are. Um, and then there's also about the letter upload mechanism. Do they have to actually email it or is there a hyperlink that gets sent to them or how how is that process? Um, fee waivers is something important. So if you can get fee waivers to not have to pay, um, these programs typically cost like 80 to $100 each to apply to. So um, many of them offer a uh, fee waiver especially for, you know, LSAM scholars, McNair scholars, Mellon Mays fellows, things like that. Um, and so typically you can get one um, or as being a student of color or being first gen, um, usually you can get a few waivers. So you just have to find that. So you need to spend some time digging to identify those. Also, if you go to conferences, like um, if you go to Abercams or SACNIS or other conferences, um, you know, the graduate schools that have booths, um, if you go and meet with them, typically they will give you a fee waiver um, by signing up for something or whatever um, whenever you meet with them. So that can get, be an opportunity so that you can apply to more schools without it costing you a lot of money. So little pro tip. This is the typical timeline. If you were gonna apply, um, say this fall, this is what it might look like. So in the fall, you're gonna take the GRE. Um, and as uh, Lila too uh, mentioned, the GRE can be a hindrance uh, for you know some folks in getting into graduate school. Many schools are moving away from it, especially because of the pandemic, but there's actually this um, website called grenotrequired.com. Um, and they have a really good um, list of schools in the STEM fields that do not require the GRE. And so um, some faculty members have put that together uh, over time. And so it's a really, really great resource. You'll also begin identifying schools, although hopefully you're going to start doing that this summer after this talk. Um, and then you're going to begin to apply. Over the winter, you would probably have your uh, interviews. They're typically going to happen like, you know, anywhere between January and March, um, but uh, there may be some that could happen in December. Um, in spring, uh, then you would be given your offers and you're going to start having to make decisions about where you want to go to school. Um, and then in the summer, you either relax because it's your last free summer, or you might be trying to finish up some research projects. And then finally, in the fall, you would start graduate school. So this is kind of high level of what to expect on that timeline for applying. 
Uh, these are the general application uh, components, and uh, we don't have time to dive into these, but we are going to talk a little bit about them. Um, so there's the online application, and I always emphasize this, and um, folks always think I'm crazy, but I, I think it's really important to talk about the application process itself. So each school is going to have an individual website that you have to go and log on and enter your demographic information over and over and over again your name, your email address, your um, sex, your, um, you know, ethnicity and race, um, your address, on and on, all of those things you're gonna have to enter over and over and over again. There are some programs that will even ask you every single course you took and the grades that you made in those courses. No idea why they ask that given that you provide a transcript what they do. And so it's really time consuming. And this is all stuff that you know, and you could start right now. So, you know, we're in midsummer. Um, applications usually actually open tomorrow. July 15th is usually when the schools aim to have those open. Um, and so this could be something that you could start right away, um, just filling in your information and starting there. I will say that for the letter of recommendations, once you enter those folks, it may send an email to them. So you want to wait to do that until you've actually asked them if they would be willing to write a letter of recommendation for you. Also in the online application, sometimes there are bonus essays. That's what I call them, although that's not what they feel like to you. Um, so in addition to writing your statement of purpose or personal statement, there may be additional essays like a diversity essay or um, uh, other essays asking you about, you know, times that you felt challenged or a time that you, you know, had success or things like that. So there's additional essays that are in here and you don't want to wait until the last minute and find out, oh, there were three more essays I didn't know I needed to write. And now you have to scramble and put them together. They are going to require transcripts. Typically, it's going to be unofficial at first. And if you are admitted, then they will ask for those official transcripts later on. There's typically going to be three letters of recommendation required. And I recommend that all of those are coming from faculty members. The statement of purpose or personal statement, they are used interchangeably, um, is about a two or so page, maybe two and a half page essay talking about why that you are um, qualified for graduate school and how that um, uh, how that you are prepared and what you hope to study when you get into that program and why it's a good fit. And then of course there's the jury and the jury comes in two flavors. The first is the general, which includes the quantitative and um, which is the math portion. And then there's the verbal, which is kind of the English portion. Um, some schools may also require a subject test, which means that then it's a discipline specific uh, test that would be say in chemistry or something, right? Um, and so that one is going to be um, challenging uh, to say the least. But anyway, that's kind of the overall components of the application. And so for our panelists, I wanted to ask um, what components were the most important for admission into your program and why? I would say all of them except for the GRE in my case. Um, I think all three of the schools that I had applied to did not really um, require the GRE. Um, so all of both, all the online applications. And then I would like to say too, that I think for Old Dominion University, I got um, on their website, it didn't mention, it mentioned a personal statement, but it didn't mention an extra essay. Um, so then when I logged into the application portal um, and completed the, started to complete the online application, uh, there was a, a hidden essay, a hidden extra essay that I had to write with a whole different prompt. Um, so sometimes, yeah, sometimes that, that website doesn't really, um, sometimes the school may not have updated their website to uh, really accurately portray the application portal. Um, so definitely, yeah, get, the earlier the better. Um, but transcripts, um, getting your letter of recommendations in order, um, and uh, for myself, I went through many rough drafts of a, of a personal statement. Uh -huh. Thanks, Sarah. And maybe we can hear from one other panelist, um, just in the interest of time. Yeah, um, for me, I think it was um, two things. I think my, or my personal statement attached with my research statement were probably one of the most important for my admission and both require them. 
but also um, the letters of rec. I don't, I think the letters of rec that I asked for were incredibly important. I made sure that there were people that really knew me and it wasn't just somebody that like casually, but like could write a strong letter of rec. And I think um, when you ask for a letter of rec, it's okay for if you ask if they're comfortable writing you a strong letter of recommendation, because that's really what you need. You don't want somebody that'll write something just like lukewarm. You want somebody that knows you well and it's like able to write something really strong. That's really great advice. Thank you. Yes, um, definitely ask about that strong, favorable letter of recommendation using terms like that to make sure that you're going to get the letter that you need to support you. Um, I do believe that from uh, the last annual con the LSMRCE conference um, that there are recordings up and I did do a session entirely on letters of recommendation. So um, you might check that out on on the website uh, and uh, and then we will have a session on applying to graduate school during the 2021 LSMRCE conference. Um, and we'll talk a lot about the personal statement during that if anybody's interested. So small commercials as we uh, continue on. All right, so let's say congratulations, you got into the program of your dreams. Now what? Um, so the first recommendation I have is that you read everything, right? So you've gone through the process, you've identified the schools, you've applied to the schools, and now you're finally admitted to the program. Um, so I recommend that you read everything and read it again. And so what do I mean by everything? So once you're admitted, and I know that all of our panelists probably uh, remember this, you start getting a ton of information, like just thrown at you, emailed to you, mailed to you, like there's just information. Um, so you're going to start learning things about what the program requirements are, what other paperwork they want. Do they want that official transcript now? Um, their funding package, and this is something you definitely need to read. What is that funding package? They might start telling you about housing options if they have on-campus housing. Um, campus visit details. So if you're going to go, um, maybe there's a second look. Um, so sometimes there's the interview and then there's kind of a second look uh, for you to come back and check out the institution again before making your decision. So there might be that. Um, other resources such as like learning about affinity groups or other student groups and things like that. And then finally, that deadline for decision, which is typically April 15th. It's um, tax day um, and it's synchronized amongst all of the grad schools. Um, and that's usually when you have to accept or reject the offer by. And so um, you all are LSAM scholars. And so I um, don't want any of you to be like, this, right? This is not going to be you. So you're going to be the ones that are reading through everything. You know what's happening. Um, and so you're going to be able to make that really um, informed decision about what's the right program for you. And so I know you all talked a little bit about this, but can you tell us a little more about what your funding package looks like? Um, did you have to teach for that? Why are you just doing research for that? Um, and what did you consider as you weighed your options for what program you ultimately decided on? Yeah, so for the program that I ultimately decided on, um, they had guaranteed funding for five years of my PhD, even if like um, if I needed all five years. Um, and so that was really important. Um, and I only needed to TA twice during that time. So that was that was just I thought um, really good because I wanted to TA anyways. I want to learn how to be um, how to teach and how to like interact with other students in that type of setting. Um, and so those were some of the things that like really drew me to the program just because sometimes it, um, some programs can have a lot of teaching requirements that can also like take a lot of time away from your research and studies and things like that. Um, so my funding package um, at the University of Kentucky was um, about 24,000 and attached with that was a teaching assistantship uh, that, I'll that, I'll, that I'll have to do during the fall and spring semester. And then um, along with that 24,000 uh, was another stipend um, for the summer, um, which was something separate. Um, it was a different separate fellowship. Um, and then I was also lucky enough to have secured um, a diversity fellowship from the um, 
um, from a department from the University of Kentucky on top of that. So for my funding with Rockers University New Brunswick, our funding came with a 32,000 stipend. And again, like I said before, for your first year, you don't have to worry about TA or GA. Um, and then they have grad fund, which really help you um, find more external fellowships. And then they help you also write grants proposal and everything. And then I did think that that was really a good deal to not miss. And it was my first option and that was my first interview. So I did go with it. I didn't even wait for the remaining schools. Okay, thank you all. Um, and so I have just a couple more slides, but I wanna be sure that we get to more Q&A from our audience. Um, and this is an important uh, commercial um, is that you thank your recommenders once you've gotten into those grad programs and let them know what you're going to do. Um, I would say I have some amazing students um, who I've recommended and they have even gone, you know, gone the full route of uh, handwritten cards. I always recommend the handwritten written cards, um, but the follow through, you have to make sure you let them know where you end up going. And um, and I always say candy and chocolate is optional for those recommenders, but I think a handwritten card is really important um, to let them know how grateful you are for them taking that time because le writing letters of recommendation is really hard. Um, our last section was to talk a little bit about succeeding in grad school. And so I do wanna ask the panelists at least one question on this. Um, and so I uh, preface this by saying getting in is just the beginning. So um, you do all of this work to get in and then there's more work, right? So once you're actually in the program, um, there's a lot of work that has to be done. Um, maybe we can do, I have three questions and I'm going to ask them and maybe each panelist can take one. How about that? Um, so the first one is what has been the most surprising thing about being in graduate school? The second is what supports do you have in graduate school? And the third is what are the key factors to success in grad school? So maybe each of you can take a stab at one of those. So whoever wants to take the surprising thing uh, can go first. I can take that one. Um, so I think the most surprising thing about being in graduate school was um, the shock that I got um, at the initial of it, of being um, hit a little bit with um, a little bit of an imposter syndrome, because I am a very, um, like before it, and even like now, I think I'm a very self-assured person in terms of my research. Like I know I do good science and I um, feel very aware of that. But once you go into a grad school, sometimes you're very much surrounded with people who are also at the same level as you all the time. <laughs> like it's like all the time people who are experts with it. And um, it it hit me that I was just, uh, that like sometimes it would, like doubt would start coming into my mind. And that took me a little bit to grapple with within graduate school. And I didn't know how to talk about it with people. And then I did, I started opening up and talking to my friends. And then they were like, oh, I've been feeling that too. Or, and I was just like, this really cool moment where we're like a lot of us grapple with imposter syndrome and it's just something that I don't think you necessarily like oh you like are done with it I think you grapple with it sometimes for a long period of time but when you start discussing it with your community that you build within graduate school and you realize that it's not just you it like it just happens to a lot of people and it's something that might just happen maybe to everyone once um, once at least, or at least once in graduate school, um, I think it's okay. But yeah, that was a bit of a shock for me. Thanks for sharing that. It's so important um, to acknowledge that and to know that that is even something that exists um, and that you're not alone in that. And so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I still remember having a conversation with my classmates and bringing it up and talking about it. And it was like this huge sigh of relief that everyone was like, oh, thank God somebody said something. Um, and so um, I, I appreciate that. So um, Aaron or uh, Lila Toe, either of you want to take uh, support? in grad school and then the other one do key factors for success 
I'd like to take this one. Okay. Um, so some supports that I have in grad school, of course, are family and friends, um, people I can vent to and share my accomplishments with. Um, and also in school, uh, choosing that faculty mentor who you're going to be working with for the next um, two to five years or two to eight years um, is very important. Um, you don't want some, you want someone who you can mesh with very well um, as a faculty mentor. I think that's one of the most important um, pieces of advice that um, a couple of my mentors have, had given me um, just to give me perspective on kind of what graduate school is. Um, and then also people who, you know, other grad students, um, other advisors, if they're not too busy, um, but also people outside of the school, or well, not outside of the school, but uh, maybe outside of uh, your department, but still within the university. Um, like I mentioned, Governor State University was pretty intimate. Um, and so I, I knew people from uh, the communication department. Um, I knew people just from a lot of different departments. And it was, um, it was nice to have, have a family outside of just my family at home, but also at the university as well. Thanks for sharing. Yes, the support network is so important for kind of surviving and thriving in grad school. Um, you need it to be able to be successful. And so then, um, do you think you can take this one? What are some key factors to success in grad school? Sure. <laughs> yeah, um, Last but not um, least. <laughs> for success, I will say you have to keep track of what you're doing, you know. Um, this is not a job. This is the last time you're gonna be ever holding a degree from a college or university. So um, make sure it's worth their time and make sure that you really did not decide to go through it and then drop out later on because you couldn't keep up with it. Um, stay organized. I, I know it's hard because you have to go through a whole bunch of information, lectures, you have um, to write lab reports, you have to be in the lab, everything, but you have to stay organized, you know. If you know you can do something today, don't say, oh, tomorrow I'll do it, because what about if tomorrow happened and then you having like headache or you have a last minute thing. So just stay organized, stay on top of your thing. If every time you feel like um, you're having too much pressure, you need to slow down, just look for your faculty advisor or the graduate school coordinator and talk to them. There are a lot of resources so that you really don't fail any classes or drop out of um, this PhD program that not everybody can get in, unfortunately. So yes, just stay organized, um, have your own plan, um, do everything at your own pace, you know, but don't also try to rush too much and don't be getting worried or frustrated if you really fail one test over like three or something. So just stay organized, you know. And if you need anything else, reach out to your peers, reach out to your family members for support. I know it's a lot to take in, especially that we are minorities, a lot are expected from us. So just hang there and it's gonna work out, you know. Thank you for sharing. Those are great tips. And the organization is so, so important, especially when you're thinking about this, you know, degree that's going to take anywhere from five to seven years, like that organization has to have it. And um, so many good points that you just made. Um, and with that, I just want to thank all of our panelists um, for just this wealth of information that you all shared with us tonight and your awesome experiences as LSAM scholars and now as graduate students. Um, and and, and just the thoughtfulness and care that you put into all of your responses. So I really appreciate that and um, want to uh, thank all of our participants for being here with us tonight. And um, here's all of my contact information. So feel free to reach out to me um, if I can be of any help. I love connecting with LCM scholars. So um, please, you know, friend me on all the social medias and um, uh, be in touch and let me know how I can help with your graduate school journey. Um, I don't know if we are allowed to do questions because I know that we're at time and I, I want to respect that. So I will defer to Brian to see what's allowed. Well, um, what we'll do is uh, any students that have uh, more questions from the panelists or Dr. Valdez, just please, um, you can type those questions. We'll collect those 
and we will get those answers to you in some forum okay. uh, here soon. Uh, but we do want to respect you guys' time as I know uh, you guys are busy. Yes. Um, but I do want to say thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Valdez. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for your honesty. I've, I've been lucky enough to, to listen to a lot of these panelists um, on grad school with Dr. Valdez, and I, I'm learning more each time, and, and, and I'm learning more because of the transparency and the honesty of, um, of the panelists. You guys are being very honest with us, and I think that that is important for our students um, because they get a chance to get, a, like, they get the cheat code. Um, so I really hope our students, you know, are really listening to what you guys are saying and taking this serious because you are giving them the inside scoop that maybe they didn't even have uh, when they started their processes. So I just want to thank you guys for your honesty, your transparency, and, um, and thank you for your endurance because these aren't easy processes to go through in life. And then Brian, do you want to do our two commercials on collaborators? And then I have one more slide on the 10 week summer series. Nope, you got it. Oh, <laughs> um, these are not, uh, I, I don't know if Deb wants to do them or not. These are not my slides. So oh, basically just, well, who we see here next are our collaborators. Go ahead, Brian. Oh yeah, yeah. So we, <laughs> I was like, we missed that one last week. So I want to say thank you to yeah. all of our collaborators. You guys know who they are. We've been working together for over a year now. And then also make sure um, that you guys are checking in with us again next week. Uh, we have a wonderful session, Dr. Valdez and I actually will be together um, as part of a discussion around work-life balance. And I know some people may hear the word work-life integration, um, but we're going to have that discussion. So hopefully uh, you guys are energetic and um, get excited about a discussion around that. Uh, so really looking forward to your questions there. One of the exciting things I think about next week's uh, session on work-life balance is that uh, several of the panelists will actually be bringing their partners and spouses into the conversation as well. So you won't just be hearing from um, me as you know a scientist and a professor, but you'll also get to hear from my partner and spouse um, about his experience uh, and supporting uh, me through these processes. So um, as well as from the other panelists. So um, it's a unique take, I think. Um, on the conversation. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. I'm going to do my best to get my wife on. <laughs> um, we'll promise you I'm going to do my best. That's right. It just might cost me. <laughs> All right. Um, well, if there's nothing else, guys, um, have a wonderful week. Thank you again. And we look forward to hearing from you once again next week. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Great job, panelists. Great job.